Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so well, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll open it up for some questions here in a second. Uh, hopefully, you 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 saw through that presentation that personalizing care, these kinds of platforms are going to be absolutely essential. I've got a couple questions for the panelists, and then I'll open it up uh, uh, for questions for, uh, from, from uh, the audience here. So maybe this one first is for, for Mark and, and Dana. You know, master data management, semantic interoperability, data governance and normalization, these are only terms that an IT geek could love. <laughs> Um, but they're critically important to actually making sure personalized healthcare becomes reality. Uh, given that Moffitt's been at this for a number of years, I wonder if you'd have any reflections on what it takes to make sure that clinicians in the research community and importantly uh, senior executives understand the importance of these things so that the queries that you just saw that are so critically important to answering those hard questions in healthcare can actually be asked reliably. So I'll, I'll, I'll start, and then Dan, if you have some comments. But I, I, I think, um, again, oftentimes we think na somewhat naively um, that it's just it's a question of, you know, implementing the software, pulling the data in, and everything's going to automatically match and, and sort of work, and we'll be able to answer uh, whatever question we have, given the data we have to work with. Um, I think to the point that you've mentioned, Brett, we have been through this uh, a couple of times. Uh, at Moffitt, and so to a large extent, I think it's learning through that history, um, and learning through the fact that there there really isn't any substitute for kind of rolling up your sleeves, getting the right stakeholders engaged who do understand the data at a very deep level, and working through some of those gnarly problems. Or, um, some of it involves some pretty clear pieces around how do the data links up, and other times you just have to make some sort of tough decisions. Uh, around what makes most sense based on the focus for that particular piece. One of the other, you know, we talked about sort of one of the guiding principles of the hub and spoke architecture. I think one of the other guiding principles that we had was being able to support multiple versions of the truth. And essentially what that means is, uh, while in many cases under industry, so the financial services industry, you don't want to have multiple services of the truth, right? That could be a disaster. You want to basically have all of your data conform and you're going to have to make some decisions around what the right uh, data element is for any particular piece. But in the health sciences industry and healthcare providers in, in general, we want to be able to access any of that data. So we do have that capability within the data model uh, to support that. We also uh, implemented what we called a golden record. So for those that didn't want to have to understand, well, what was the ultimate data source of that or how is it conformed, uh, we did make those decisions and researchers can select uh, from those particular fields if, if that's what their level of interest is. But we also have folks who clearly do have deep knowledge of the data and want to be able to work with it at that level. So, I think, um, as you mentioned, Mark, that stakeholders are very important. Uh, we've really been able to leverage the cancer registry in, a, in multiple ways. So Mark mentioned the cancer registry. We have 20 certified tumor registrars on staff that take about two and a half ab hours to abstract each patient. We have detailed staging, diagnosis, treatment information. We also do follow up within the cancer registry. And although it's not as detailed, perhaps, as some of the clinicians might want for their own research, what they've come to understand through using the data so far is that those data are always there <laughs> and that they're always there and coded in a way that's relatively easy to analyze. And so that's been, excuse me, useful as we simultaneously redesign our EMR. So we didn't speak too much about this, but we're in the process of rolling out an EMR that's tailored to the individual clinical programs. And as they see that they have direct access to querying the HRI platform, it becomes a lot more tangible, if you will, to imagine, gee, if I if I actually filled out this, these discrete values in, in the EMR, I could then query those values in the database. And it has a lot more uh, tangible value to them being able to see the transmed tool at their desktops. For example, the synoptic path reports are another example. If we could get the pathologist to fill out the synoptic path reports, those data would then be available in real time and you wouldn't have the six month delay you have with the cancer registry. And so part of it is um, get, giving everyone more exposure to the warehouse so that they understand that there really could be access to better data if they were to f use the EMR the way it's being designed. And just one final comment, we've been able to leverage this data governance infrastructure 
to better inform the redesign of the EMR. So I mentioned one of the TCC committees is the Data Acquisition Committee, where we have engaged both clinicians and researchers who aren't necessarily clinicians, and some that are both, to talk about how we could code, for example, current disease status in a way that's meaningful clinically, but also consistent across, for example, the solid tumors, so that we could bring those data into the hub and have a better outcome for tracking disease progress rather than overall survival. And so we've really been able to leverage those committees to bring together the different stakeholders in defining data standards. Great. Thanks for that. And did I see a question in the audience? or? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and to, par to paraphrase it, if I can, if folks didn't hear the question, um, can you hear that okay, by the way? Did it, everybody, okay. So we've not achieved um, stage one meaningful use. Um, we've, we've had a number of things on our place. We just actually implemented a brand new revenue cycle system at the same time, so. No, um, <laughs> you're not It really is, but we do see this as being able to help with that. So, you know, Dana referenced the fact that, um, and as Brett did even in the opening slide around this whole idea of a real-time healthcare learning system and that the bench informs the bedside and back again. And so obviously that's really the goal that we're going to. We made a very purposeful decision to slow down um, on the EMR rollout uh, until we really had our arms around, particularly sort of the phase one piece of the health and research informatics platform, because we knew that would help inform the design around that. So using a very, very specific example, um, you know, particularly in cancer care, the, how the patient's responding is obviously a very critical data point, oftentimes captured almost intuitively by the clinician, may be recorded somewhere in the note, in the dictated note but oftentimes not as a discrete field that can be aggregated across hundreds or thousands even of, pa uh, of patients. So building that into the EMR, um, we happen to be uh, a Cerner shop uh, for a health IT vendor. We're working with them on their oncology specific EMR, but these are some of the pieces we actually want to be able to build in. So we made actually a very specific decision to delay that. We'll probably be uh, applying for meaningful use in 2013. Um, as a result of that. It also feeds back very much into the clinical pathways that, that Rob referenced. Um, so how we build order sets, how do I know that, or to what extent is the patient that I have in front of me compare with all of the other patients that we have in the database from a clinical and phenotypic and genotypic perspective? And then what were their outcomes and how does that guide my own treatment decisions? So obviously that's the holy grail. Part of this is as being some of the reporting Absolutely, absolutely. Correct. So phase two, we're really moving heavily now into the clinical piece and beginning to capture. We have moved our EMR now through probably about four of our clinical clinic programs um, and plan to get those rolled out through the re end of this calendar year. So we'll be up on an outpatient basis on the EMR. And we'll be feeling good about that. And then we'll turn our attention to CPOE on the inpatient side and so forth and, and the rest of it. But that's where really building um, the clinical pathways and having those algorithms by which you can make those treatment decisions, which typically happens within the course of electronic ordering and so <coughs> forth is gonna be so important. Yeah, and if I could even add to that, uh, and then we'll grab your question, from a, taking a step back from Moffitt to a broader market perspective, meaningful use is great on one level because it's, it's driving adoption that may otherwise have taken 10 years to happen. I referenced cash for clunkers. The danger of meaningful use is it is very prescriptive. And so there could be a rush to implement EMRs quickly to get the checkbox ticked, but then miss the broader picture of what we might do with this data to actually change healthcare. So we may win the battle, get the box ticked, and, and lose the war, whereas Moffitt has stepped back and said, how are we going to use this data? Where do you see as the, the, the contribution of 
Do you want to take that one? That's a loaded question. <laughs> it is a bit of a loaded question. I think, um, I, I mean, I think th there's thinking through, obviously, we think of meaningful use really as the tactics to, to, to get to that ultimate strategy. Um, but as Brett referenced and as I referenced, I think it is really a, a taking a step back um, from that tactical implementation and really thinking about the long-term strategy around that. So I, that's where I think the funding needs to be. And as we've talked about um, many times, it really does, doesn't does happen just within the healthcare provider space. It's not going to happen just within the health sciences space uh, or in the technology vendor space. It's really all three of those groups partnering and, and really making that happen. And I think that's probably the key piece of where that funding needs to go. It's probably one of the reasons why we have kind of a unique business model where we have a wholly owned um, uh, for-profit subsidiary uh, of a non-profit organization. And it's because you really need that kind of driver, that go-between that can help um, making one of these. And, and one of them is that you really have to think through the issues of what data you're going to capture. And I think the old notion was if you just take all the information from different systems and you bring them together, we're going to sort through this somehow, transform it, and understand it. But the truth is that this is no different than any other protocol, even though there's a lot of information of bells and whistles. You have to think out what the questions are and how you're going to define things like response up front. And that's difficult even for clinical trials because they don't agree among each other. Um, part of me feels that the technology for doing that is actually on the way so we can start looking at radiographs and having snapshots of that. And we have a program of research looking at that. Can you, can you show response or non-response through algorithms that are done? Um, but to, to make it translatable for clinical research, there are some regulatory things where we can't really do a lot of data sharing between specific research protocols and our, our, our data warehouse at large because there's, there's, there's issues there. Um, but all of this is meant to be translatable into standard clinical research language that we can use this for clinical trials because we're actually developing clinical trials right now based upon the information. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay. And there's just a difference in, in how you go about data collection for an experimental trial versus an observational study, let's say. So it, as Rob mentioned, we have CRF data on maybe 11% of patients who are enrolled in trials. Bringing them in in the warehouse, aside from the compliance piece of it and proprietary piece of it, it's really not helpful if it's only on 11% of people and we don't have those endpoints defined the same way across all of the patients. So really what you're doing is leveraging observational data for analyses like CER or other secondary analyses that would help in biomarker discovery, which would then provide the evidence you would need to perhaps propose a biomarker-driven trial and then use the HRI to identify eligible cohorts for conducting that trial. I was thinking in a different direction. So if, for, let's say, a clinical trial, mm -hmm. there's, at the end of the clinical trial, there's important demographic, basic, and molecular information that you now want to question as a result of that trial. You want to go back and explore. Is your, you know, can you go back into your data warehouse to to query from your clinical trial database and, and, and then do the correlation, the appropriate correlation. So the answer to that would be yes, but it would be dependent upon agreement with the company that collected the molecular information in the first place. We, as you know, contracts are, are, in, are protected, so yeah. But the architecture would support the central yes. agency. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Geisinger Health System, I'm a physician lead for clinical analytics and uh, have been close to our warehousing effort now for the last two years. Uh, we're about five years into it and we're moving to a new, uh, new environment. Uh, also tasked with uh, uh, building out the re research um, infrastructure for uh, data warehousing and those, those needs are ne very unique as you know. So I'm uh, really congratulatory on your on your work down there. It's really excellent and uh, nation leading. Um, I have a thousand questions, but I'm going to pare them down to to three. I, I hope. Um, so the first one is, what kind of manpower uh, does it take uh, from an IT and an IS uh, perspective to really deliver results out of an environment like like the one that you have? Um, number two, um, in terms of the utility of the um, 
uh, business intelligence tools, we've really struggled. And so what's, how many people do you have out there deriving value from your uh, warehouse? Um, we have struggled with that. Uh, our tools have been um, really not well adopted by our, our clinical community. Um, and so we have a handful of analysts that have direct SQL level access and, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting themselves for the organization. Um, so that's the second question. And then the third, uh, I guess it relates to um, the, the question from there. Um, I know the ONC is actively uh, asking for information about how they can query um, through the National Health Information Network uh, directly uh, IDN uh, and, and organizational e uh, EHR records. So obviously with, with vendors uh, like Cerner Epic and others having very different data models and very different uh, spe specifications around their data types, um, do you see the warehouse and the common data model being able to answer those questions for population health statistics? And do you think that the warehouse is really going to be the point of connectivity for the NHIN, or is it going to be the EHR? Um, so what do you think about that? I would ask 10 more questions, but I'm going <laughs> to leave it at that. Uh, great questions. Maybe I can start with the resourcing question and then um, pass it along to Dan or Rob. Or, um, but we could all certainly jump in on I, uh, from the resourcing piece. So you know, at the beginning, it's really what are the questions that you want to be able to answer, not just now, but in the future? Because as we all know, with these types of efforts, or even quite frankly with a static report, once you see data, you immediately want to, you have more questions, right? It just it drives questions. So in thinking that through and in the information architecture piece, it takes quite literally at times a cast of thousands, it seems, uh, to get folks around around the table. And, and I think that's perhaps where Moffitt has a little bit of uniqueness, certainly from my experience, um, not only because uh, we've been through it, and so we've sort of had some hard lessons learned around what doesn't work, uh, but the fact that without that sort of cast of thousands, you really can't get your arms around how all of these critical linkages and identifying the critical data points that you do need to collect can, e can even be identified. I think the other unique piece is the way that we're organized around our clinical disease programs where you, you do typically have clinicians and researchers sitting across the table from each other uh, helping to kind of work through those pieces and identify, okay, not only what data exists today, but what data do we need to exist in the future through our EMR design. At the IT level specifically, um, again, I mentioned it really was in many ways sort of a four-way team effort between Moffitt internal IT resources, uh, Oracle resources. Uh, we used Deloitte, as I mentioned, as a systems integrator, and uh, Transmed, which is uh, the company uh, that has the application that Dana showed some of the screenshots for. Um, the Probably the most resource-intensive piece, just from a technology perspective, was doing a lot of that extract transformation and loading piece. So that's where we worked with Deloitte again to help them stand up uh, an offshoring practice uh, around that. So uh, the folks in Mumbai who are working on this are every much experts around our data as, as Moffitt folks are. Uh, and obviously that's something that they, you know, it works for Deloitte to be able to extend that out to other clients that they have as well going forward. Um, on the IT side specifically, we probably have all told, uh, I'd say on average maybe of about 12 FTEs that are working on this full time between supplementing some of that offshoring work as well as uh, doing sort of the, the direct support for the data warehouse itself. Uh, and then obviously for the front end tools, which is the critical piece. And we would only anticipate that, that growing over time. From the information shared services side of things, we have uh, three people, three FTEs in the data concierge office itself, and then another six in data quality in the project management office that facilitates actual pulling the databases together. Um, there are other individuals within the informatics core, the tissue core, and M2Gen that have data responsibilities that we use heavily <laughs> in, in, in the HRI process, not just in designing it, but also in releasing data. So it's hard to factor exactly how many FTEs, but you get a, a sense of that. Uh, for, the, for the consortium, for the M2Gen effort, for Moffitt and everything, the, it's around 150 FTEs uh, complete that are involved in this. So. So 
there are there are FTA efforts that's given at the different sites for different roles, such as consenting, uh, biobanking, those kinds of things. Um, there's the central M2Gen um, building that we have that actually has a biorepository. It has uh, robotic systems for freezing and, and, and standardizing. Uh, there's abstractors that are um, part of that. Um, there's uh, uh, people that are components of the ISS and, and IT that are that are devoted to that. What was question two? Yeah. Um, so, oh, yes. Qu I, I think we got through question two. Uh, concierge, I think, is the third. I, I wrote it down as the answer is the concierge. So, so because, because there's a disconnect between what we want to ask and how things are currently structured, there's no real way to just to make an automatic tool that's going to sit there and say, how many uh, uh, melanomas do you have? And then it comes back and it gives you an answer. And you're like, oh, this is great. But it really... And then he goes, well, what do you mean by melanoma? And what do you mean by stage? And what do you mean by... And so you actually have to have somebody who's fluent in both parts of that. And so we developed this whole ISS concierge service to work as a filtering tool. In fact, at times, we even had these um, um, committees that were formed of basically biostatisticians, pathology experts, that would get together and help somebody define their question. And then we would actually structure out how we were going to answer that, what sources we were going to get them from. And to Mark's point of... It's a never-ending process when the research world hits. You know, it's like, oh, now I want to ask another question. That we've already defined the scope of the original project, so our IT people could move on to something else, and they weren't constantly bogged down. Well, yeah, and, and the other thing is, in terms of analytics, every researcher has his or her preference. So the the statisticians in the in the biostatistical core prefer to program in SAS or R. The informatics group have their own tools to look at the molecular data. Um, some of the population sciences like SPSS. I mean, it's just in order to accommodate those preferences, we really looked to um, investing in the front end tool that would allow for querying and cohort identification and then have this process that Rob described um, for actually creating the data set in basically Excel, so you can then go and analyze it any way you want. So that's kind of how we're, we're accommodating people's preferences in, in the analytics tools themselves. At this point, we don't have analytics in Transmet. It's mainly focused on cohort identification. But certainly as we build out the spokes and look to, to put clinical decision-making support tools in place and that the, the analytics and front-end tools will evolve to, to meet those needs as well. Okay, great. Do we have another question here? Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Guo Chengxi. I know some of you, you know, work with the, on the Merck Muppet collaboration. I'm managing the, the IT on the Merck side. We do get a lot of data from you guys, so thank you. So I, I do have, a, you know, uh, a couple of questions, you know, like the gentleman there. So the first one, I guess, when you, you know, start to look at this, you look at, you know, what would be at some point? What would be the return on the investment we put into? You know, what's what's your guys' justification like? You know, to actually get into you know HDM HRI. That's my first question. Yeah. So I'll take a stab at we. Um, to be honest, we did not develop a full financial ROI on this. We we had um, a vision. I think. Um, and I think, again, particularly for, for Moffitt, um, the ROI for us was really being able to deliver on that vision for, for personalized medicine rather than obviously for a financial incentive. Now, we, we have worked obviously with, with Merck and some, some other companies around this piece, so it was critical for us to be able to, to continue to keep those partnerships going and to, and to really grow them uh, over time. So that was, that was actually a major incentive for us as well. But, um, it wasn't per se sort of sitting down and really thinking through the specific, you know, financial return. It was really being able to, the return was really being able to deliver on that vision. Okay, thank you. So my second question is uh, surrounding the HDM model. Uh, do you find it sufficient or you have to tweak it uh, to meet your specific need? And just surrounding that is how do you actually manage the, the master data when you showed you know, in th for the you know element, the sex element, data element, you have this uh, cancer registry, you have the CERNA, you have the questionnaire. How do you reconcile the difference when you put the data into HRI? Depending on where it's coming from, do you actually 
you know, enumerate all the cases? H how does that work? So maybe we'll tackle that question first. Okay. Um, for certain data elements, gender, race, ethnicity, smoking, that we have captured across source systems in a way that's fairly consistent so you could potentially conform them, we have created, as Mark described, these derived variables. But we also maintain the individual variables from the different source systems and propagate all of them into the front end tool. So how it's actually displayed is you click on, double click on the folder that says gender, for example, and there are four icons that are labeled gender cancer registry, gender Cerner, gender patient questionnaire, and gender derived. And the definitions, as I mentioned, for how those are defined in the source systems as well as the algorithms behind the derived variable itself are all documented within the data dictionary. So if you're, if you're a, a population scientist who only wants to access the questionnaire data and look at it as a package, if you will, then you would select gender questionnaire because what you're trying to compare, you're, you're working with the questionnaire data as a whole. And the concept of bringing in something from um, you know, cancer registry is not, you wouldn't be able to get your paper published that way. So they just want to work with questionnaire data. On the other hand, um, some of our basic scientists who are interested in you know, how does gender affect gene expression levels, you know, when exposed to a particular drug, and they just want to know gender, the most complete non-missing data. And so they would use gender derived, for example. So in those cases, all of the multiple versions of the truth, if you will, are propagated through to transmit and displayed as such, but it's all documented and very transparently so that the end users can select what they want. And if there's confusion about what they may want to use, we have the concierge to help them through that. And the Oracle, the HDM Yeah, so piece. as far as the HDM, and that you had asked about the completeness of the model, I think from our perspective, and I, I was a little bit, to be honest with you, in the early stages, a little bit dubious about it just because, you know, how can you really sort of build a, a, an entire data model around healthcare. But for us, I think we found it was probably close to 90 to 95 percent complete. Uh, the model can certainly accommodate, if you will, sort of customized uh, fields or attributes that you want to be able to add. But uh, just by the nature of the, the partnership that Moffitt had with Oracle, and it made sense certainly for Oracle to incorporate those, they were actually fairly able to turn around the, the additional elements we needed fairly quickly. So. It's, it's for us, it's been a very complete data model. One quick question, <clears throat> one quick question, I'll turn it back to the audience uh, that I'm surprised hasn't come up, especially with some lawyers in the audience, um, is the consent process. And uh, yeah, I'm glad the Merck Moffitt collaboration came up. And given that uh, there is a lot of collaboration between Moffitt and the biopharmaceutical industry, um, I'd be curious what the consent rate is from patients to participate in the total cancer care protocol, uh, knowing that there's uh, external collaborations going on, and maybe reflect on, on that number as well. Yeah, so, so my understanding of the law is getting better as I sit more and more with lawyers. But <laughs> uh, basically, uh, we have it very clear in there that they're donating this as a gift and that the, the tissues and everything else are, are, are a gift um, and that we may also make it very transparent that we're going to be using this in research and then we'll have industrial partners that may be making discoveries and that they will have no financial benefit to the patient back. So we decided that just the transparent approach works, you know, and if you put that there in the consent and you, and you, and you hammer it through, then um, uh, there doesn't seem to be any issue. So I'm going to go back to the database in here and say, what do you mean by percentage? So excellent question. It depends, it depends on the consortium site. Um, because we had finite resources, we decided to target certain um, very specific populations with the resources that we had. Of, um, of programs overall, though, I would say about 50 percent of patients have, have been approached. Um, it's about 80 percent of new patients because that's where there's real benefit. There were certain tumor types and tumor programs that we uh, specifically were targeting at first, uh, at least within our own center. Um, and so we have five FTEs that are actually devoted just to consenting there and, and using the electronic tablet. And that's sufficient for about uh, 150 to 200 consents a week. I think, uh, so there's a distinction, it, it all depends on the denominator. So there's a distinction between the percentage that are approached and of those then 
who consented. And so we approach about, you think it's about 50%. We only have five FTEs covering, you know, we have at least 8,000 new patients per year. So it's just a resource issue of of not being able to actually approach every single patient. But of those that are approached, uh, at least from the data I've seen from the cutaneous clinic, it's on the order of about 70% that agree to participate. Mm-hmm. And that's at Moffitt. Again, it's impossible to come up with a denominator really at the consortium sites because it is so targeted to particular clinics within those sites. We have a question over yeah. here. I uh, have a question regarding your comment on the frozen tissue. You said that you have frozen tissue of the patient that you make them available. Now, I assume that these are the same patient that you have the clinical um, outcome, perhaps, or the clinical response, right? So so there are over 350,000 patients in, live right now in HRI, and only a subset of them are consented to TCC, and only a subset of them have fresh frozen tumor tissues available. So I think Rob had on his slide the, the current number of, of patients consented and numbers of tissues available mm-hmm. around 70,000 consented mm-hmm. for TCC, including Moffitt and the consortium sites at Moffitt. I think about 40,000 of those are from Moffitt. So, but again, 350,000 yep. right. are in the database. So mm-hmm. this is where the Venn diagram feature is helpful. Uh, and you can actually see the relationship between those who are consented, those that actually have tumor tissue available, and and those that are just in the database who who are not consented to TCC, who, but who for who you can use data if you obtain IRB approval and the appropriate waiver of informed consent that would go along with that. So let's say if I am interested in a specific uh, molecular uh, pathway in this tissue and I look at those tissue and I find something interesting, can I go back to the uh, clinical response? I, I assume that you have that data available. So yes and no. Um, so again, going back and lessons learned is you only have that data if you specifically collect it. So in a clinical trial, you specifically look for things like response, and you tie them together with the therapy that you are delivering and administering, and you look for other kinds of factors that may go with that. Um, So we have workarounds um, on some of that. Some of that we do have very specific response stuff because we were interested in collecting that. Um, So to answer your question, it somewhat depends. You can go back and abstract certain information if it's available, but we all know the quality of clinical notes, at least those of us who practice, uh, I have problems figuring out what cancer my patient has sometimes from the notes that are existing, so. Well, and I think it's important because another lesson learned was that you cannot go about abstracting all of the information that you imagine one might want to know five years down the line. And so you have to take a two-tiered approach get enough data on all patients so that you can identify out of the hundreds of thousands now in your database, the maybe 300 that have that particular gastric cancer of interest. And now you have a gene expression profile and you would like to know of the of those 300, what was their clinical progression. At that point, put your resources into pulling the radiology reports and having a centralized panel of radiologists review it and look at inter-rater reliability in a very rigorous scientific way. And then you have the information you need for that subset of patients, which is resource intensive and you could never do across all patients. So it's really kind of thinking about this two-tiered approach of getting enough data across all patients that you could drill down to the right subset and then deploy your resources to get the relevant data that's specific to the question at hand. We have another question here? Uh, Glenn Bach. Um, uh, I guess, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another one? No. Yeah. Um, I'm, talk to you after. I'm a, both a clinician and investigator, so I'll, I'm looking at this, I guess, as a user. Um, you, from a practical standpoint, you broker a lot of data to a lot of potential a lot of potential users. Um, in doing that, particularly when mining, uh, or at least looking at some key issues and then going and retrospectively pulling available data in, in your, in your, um, in your uh, warehouse, how do you regulate that 
What restrictions do you put on the investigators? How does your IRB, how do your IRBs handle that uh, in terms of de-identified data or data that's de brokered and de-identified? Uh, do they have oversight over that? Is it freely publishable? Do you consider it generalizable knowledge uh, as outcome? Or um, uh, 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 I mean, how do you steward that? You want me to answer that, Rob? You look like you're about to yeah. saddle up to the mic there. <laughs> so um, all, of your, all of your questions are, are the pertinent questions, I think, that everybody has around this. Uh, so because the data use is, is with so many different parties. And so uh, we have, we've had institutional buy-in from investigators to contribute their patients, their tissue, and their, their, um, their blood samples into a centralized resource. And so they have a stake in this. And then we have industry partners who also want to come in and have a stake in this. So what keeps me, as one type of oncologist, from going in there and taking all your melanoma patients and, and doing a bunch of exploration and uh, pulling the rug out from you? So it all came down to, to governance. Um, so you have to have all the right people who sign off on a project when it gets proposed. So whether it's de-identified or not, everything goes through one central request. So this goes through the ISS, through a web form that we have that defines the data elements that you're looking for and actually has whether or not it requires SRC or IRB and pins all those documents. That then goes through the ISS, who then can shuttle it over to something like the Protocol uh, Management Committee to look and make sure it's compliant with what we are, we are doing. Plus, we can get different checkoffs that may be stakeholders in this. So if it's well, let's say it's an industrial partner. There's certain contracts that say that if it's over a certain number of patients that are being mined for certain reasons, so we have to include them in the decision making. So all that gets checked and verified. We make sure that the programs are okay with it. And remarkably efficient. Um, so I, I, think, I think the whole process probably takes us about a week or two in complicated cases. Um, it, yeah, it depends, right? So, it depends. so if, if the request is just for de-identified data, the, the way all protocols are handled is they're, they're first reviewed by Moffitt's SRC, Scientific Review Committee. And once they get scientific approval, if they need IRB approval, we, we collaborate with US, the University of South Florida. So we use their IRB, and we have several investigators who sit on that IRB. Mm -hmm. uh, but of importance in, in the last six months or so, Moffitt can now determine what's human subjects research on, on our own. So if it's truly a, a request for de-identified data through the ISS on its broker, then the SRC can determine that that actually doesn't even meet the criteria for not, for human subjects research and so it can get it doesn't have to go through full blown SRC review. Now if they need PHI then then it would go through SRC and then shuttle to the IRB. If they are requesting to recontact patients through the protocol or do something that's not covered under the umbrella of protocol, it would go to the protocol management committee. So again it's sort of triage depending on what's being requested, but we try to make it as efficient as possible so that those who are requesting the minimum aren't waiting months, for example. So, so that the identified or this non human subject research that the SRC would look at it for at least quality and oversight and then make a decision at that point without needing to go and look for exempt or IRB uh, IRB determination. So something like that could be, yeah, that could be expedited. But but one of the elements they're looking for, it too, is how is the data being used? So are they asking for all patients and they're just going to mine this in, in several different ways and come up with statistically unreliable information because you're going to have a lot of false hits in that case and are also using your, your validation sets. So we have to, we've got a set of about five biostatisticians who are experts in using this kinds of mass data. And we try to make sure that one of them is involved with uh, such questions. I mean, importantly, we're, we're trying to ensure that people have an a priori hypothesis they're testing. There you go. And, that, so, and there, so sometimes there's a tension. People want to mine the data, and yet right. then, of course, you leave yourself open as an institution to a very high probability of false positive findings. And so uh, if, if someone were to publish these findings and they weren't to be replicated and someone were to come back to Moffitt and say, what assurances did you have in place that, that at least there was a hypothesis being tested here? We want to make sure we 
can provide documentation to indicate that all of these protocols were received some level. CEO and there are other members there that we can get you in touch with. Great. I think there's a question in the back. I mean, that's all meaningful research too, and so the the whole design of this is is really total care uh, that focuses on. Yes, we. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so that's part of the questionnaire originally, and um, uh, actually, I have a side project which is on integrative medicine uh, in my own program, looking at uh, impacts of different types of um, uh, alternative. Uh, therapies to help somebody through chemotherapy. So that kind of research is spin-off research. It's completely endorsed. And I know we talk a lot about treatment and markers and, and those kinds of things, but um, yeah, it's holistic. I think there are two two things we didn't really cover that we'd, I would be nice to elaborate on here. One is the, the health outcomes and behavior program and, and the influence they've had on the EPQ design, and the other would be the portal. So I'll just speak mm -hmm. to the former first. Um, Rob mentioned uh, uh, complementary and alternative medicine. So this questionnaire that takes 45 minutes to complete includes mm -hmm. information on smoking, alcohol, physical activity, diet, the use of over-the-counter medications, including like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, as well as herbal supplements, all of the over uh, alternative yep. medicines that are marketed that can actually interfere with chemotherapy. And so we're documenting all of that quality of life, the SF12 index, as well as other uh, social support questions and um, psychosocial questions that could be used not only as predictors of outcomes, but also as outcomes themselves, because we administer not just at baseline, but now we're looking to administer this questionnaire at follow-up as well. So it's looking at uh, the influence of diet, lifestyle factors, psychosocial factors on uh, clinical outcomes, as well as looking at those as outcomes themselves. And so we have a very active health outcomes and behavior program that looks at uh, all of these aspects from a research standpoint. But Mark can speak to what we actually do for the patients themselves through the portal. So I think it was on Rob's slide you had sort of one of these pieces. We talked about the various portals. What we've largely been talking about today is mostly the researcher portal. Uh, there's also a patient portal. And it does all of the typical things that oftentimes you'd think of as a healthcare patient portal, so you know they can look at their appointments, request appointment changes, prescription renewals, uh, communicate securely with their providers and so forth and all of those types of things. But it's also the primary vehicle by which most patients actually go in and complete the questionnaire even before they come to Moffitt. They have that data available to them as well as all of their own clinical data, so that includes lab results and even clinical notes. All of that is available. It's interesting, we're actually starting to get feedback from patients that said, you know what, Doc, I noticed you mentioned this in my history, but that's actually not quite accurate. What it was was this. So uh, we were a little bit worried at first. I should say a lot of our clinicians were concerned and worried about, is this going to open up? What, what is this going to open up? But it's actually been an extremely uh, beneficial uh, piece. As a second stage to the patient portal, given the fact that we do know, if you will, sort of so much clinically and eventually, um, you know, genotypically about these patients, is we want to be able to provide them with content that's actually very specific to their disease. Um, most patients, when they get diagnosed, one of the first things any of us would do is go out and start Googling this, right? And there's lots of really bad information out on the internet. So we want to be able to provide very high quality content uh, to patients. We've got um, 
I think Dana may have mentioned, we've got a, um, a strong collaboration with the Lance Armstrong Foundation, Live Strong Foundation, so they've allowed us to incorporate their content, particularly around survivorship, directly into the patient portal. Uh, and again, we can provide that to the patient specifically based on their disease. The questionnaire that goes into the portal when on the income data, is, is that directly incorporated into your EHR as findable fields, or is it some sort of verification. That's a great question. Today it's not, uh, but it's definitely on the roadmap for us probably within the next 12 months to actually have that as discrete data points within mm -hmm. SAR. Mm -hmm. direct entry uncensored on, on, on that. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's discreetly available in the data warehouse, of course, for querying and, and we, we all, through the right. EMR. All right. we, we also want to be able, although there's a sort of point in time questionnaire, we also want to be able to do longitudinal follow-up studies with patients through that, through the patient portal. So for them to be able to, to do an outreach to the patient, how are you doing? Are you having any sort of, you know, uh, downstream of side effects and things like that? So. Three words. <laughs> Um, so is the question really that that's the actual data and how do we do that within sort of current data metrics or? Just the, the nurse misentered Quality check. Ah. It's in the record now. Right. And, and it flows over into your warehouse and your ETL. Got it. Are you doing anything about that? Um, not for those specific examples that you've mentioned. What we do have a number of quality checks that we've built into the ETL process that gets caught and reviewed. We actually have, if you will, sort of a collaborative review process between IT and the Information Shared Services Department that Dana oversees. So, for example, if, it, if there's a, a normal trigger that there's an out-of-range uh, value that just doesn't make sense and we've built that business rule in, obviously that's got to be built into there first. The IT team can usually look at that, provide feedback directly back to uh, the data steward for that particular application. If, it, if we're beginning to see anomalies in the data and it's not clear from an immediate sort of technology investigation, then we have the data quality team engaged and we start to look at that more broadly. And amazingly, the users are very vocal about findings like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, and there are also QC procedures in place at the source system. So, Rob, you might be able to comment what happens if a lab value comes back implausible. What is there some kind of flag that's raised for the clinician if, if, if a laboratory value is Well, actually, it, it, that's, that starts range. in the lab itself. I mean, they, they actually identify that and usually will call us before. Exactly. So there's so. there are checks in, in the lab system. On the cancer registry side, for example, there are edit checks prior to submission of data to the state. So uh, if you have a 35-year-old prostate cancer patient, a flag is raised and you have to manually override it and document that that actually occurred. And so various algorithms in place to look for those types of, of quality indicators. Just a comment on the data we receive from, from them. We have we have certain business rules that are in place, you know, a lot of them based on the past experience. For example, you don't want to see a female with, with prostate cancer, right? You don't, you know, when a male patient has a breast cancer, you want to look, is this real or is it really a fluke? So we do, you know, at least on the data feed from, you know, amtogen to Merck, on a daily basis, we have a lot of the business rules they have to run on that side to make sure they pass those rules. All right, I think we'll take one or two more questions, and I suspect there's probably food out there, which is why we're losing some folks. <laughs> this is Chris Yoshi from Oracle. Um, as an interested stakeholder here, obviously, having supported your project at, uh, at all levels, it's really gratifying to see the sort of foundational capabilities you're putting in. The question I have for you is, how would you describe to the broader cancer community the two or three things that you couldn't do before that you can do now, keeping in mind that you are very much a microcosm for the broader you know, cancer world. You're solving the problems that everybody wants to really address. Okay. Um, <laughs> we can actually look for patients with certain characteristics um, uh, and identify cohorts. So that's a huge step forward just in itself, and that was already you know, put to the test 
on a, on a, on a, on a clinical trial. So I think, I think that was kind of a landmark moment of something that we could do now that we couldn't do before. I would say just the whole data governance committee structure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I like organization. So when I first stepped in the position and there were a million groups tackling, everyone recognized that different issues needed to be tackled, but there was no clear responsibility assigned for any of the individual tasks. And we actually were wasting a lot of time by having people working on the same thing in silos and not even understanding that. And, and having the committee structure in place and understanding where the areas of expertise lie and being able to pull together the right people uh, to tackle the right topics is really gratifying. Uh, we have, you know, what you can do collectively is amazing if you can actually, you know, organize yourselves. So it's it's been, I think, very gratifying in the last year to just see how much more synergized we are and how much more progress we can make more quickly in being organized. I would echo that comment. I think, you know, there was a question that was asked, uh, you know, is it going to be electronic health records or will it, will it be the sort of data warehouses that will lead a lot of those pieces? And it, obviously it's going to be both. I mean, it's an ongoing feedback loop between both of those. We're not going to get the Cerners and the Epics probably to sit down any time in the short term and agree on standard, you know, data models and so forth. Um, so I think you have to start with what you can get your arms around and be able to demonstrate progress on that front. And as to Dana's point, I think that becomes it, certainly at Moffitt um, and at the consortium sites and with Mark and others that we're starting to work with, extremely energizing because people say, you can actually do this. It's not, it's not just a vision anymore. You can actually accomplish this. So it's, uh, it's very, very exciting. All right. Well, I think on that note, we'll, uh, we'll break. We'll be happy to stay up here and uh, take some additional questions. Hopefully, you got a glimpse into the future and that the future is not too far off. So thanks, everybody, for your time and attention. Thank and uh, thank you, panelists, for a great session. Thank you. Thank you.